Thank you very much, uh, Sara, and uh, thanks to all the audience, wherever they may be. Um, well, the, one of the ubiquitous characteristics of humanitarian crises in South Sudan is that it has always had multiple faces. And these faces are very well captured in this uh, issue of the humanitarian exchange. Uh, thanks for doing that. Uh, one of the faces of humanitarian crisis in South Sudan all throughout the last uh, 20 years, uh, since 1991, when um, Operation Lifeline Sudan was uh, set up to aid the war-affected populations, is that uh, conflict uh, and violence and, uh, and in intensity of insecurity have always gone hand in hand with what you may describe as humanitarian crises. So the, the, the most permanent face of humanitarian problems in South Sudan is violence. Uh, it also has uh, a woman's face, it has a child face, uh, in the sense that the, the most visible victims of some of these humanitarian issues are mainly uh, households and families. So women and children are often the most visible victims. Uh, it also has the face of marauding armies, uh, of the uh, warlordism of yesteryear. And uh, it also has the characteristic that this face, the humanitarian crisis face in South Sudan, is sometimes quickly disappearing when other events occur in other parts of the world, it quickly gets forgotten. Um, the collective of all of these faces, of these multitudes of faces, is that um, the need for humanitarian action in South Sudan has become the face of the whole country called South Sudan. That South Sudan is a country that is constantly in need of international action. Uh, whether in terms of responding to the consequences of violence or in terms of assisting its government to be able to deal with these things. It has become the face of the whole country in the eyes of the world. Uh, this face that South Sudan has globally has truth in it, but it also has half-truth. The truth in it is that, of course, Many corners of South Sudan have their own unique humanitarian issues. Uh, it has the deficit in government delivery of public goods and services. So there is truth in, in South Sudan having that face globally. Um, the hard truth about it, of course, is that uh, much of what is uh, written or uh, talked about outside South Sudan has a stereotypical characteristic, as uh, Toby was saying, because uh, focusing on humanitarian issues means that there is never a space given or very little space given to progress made over the last eight years since uh, the CPA was signed. And so um, a great deal of progress has been made in being a society that can be, can 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 weather uh, this uh, this crisis. Um, uh, much more uh, road network between states is now uh, uh, a reality. Uh, telephone lines and enrollment in schools, uh, number of nurses that have been trained. So a lot of progress has been made in an effort to deal with this long history. Uh, of violence having created uh, this humanitarian face for South Sudan. I mean, we're talking about 200 years of, of conflict on and off, uh, 200 years of, um, of foreign rule and resistance to it. So obviously it is going to take a long time to deal with that long history of violence and its consequences. Another half-truth about this face is that it does not recognize the the fact that 
humanitarian issues in South Sudan are sometimes localized. They are not across the board. Uh, so uh, people may be reading about the debacle in in Jongle, but they don't see the word Jongle. They see South Sudan. Um, the result uh, is that we are, the, if you combine these half-truths and the truth about humanitarian phase of South Sudan, you will find that, of course, we are still an NGO nation and a UN nation. It's been uh, decades now of humanitarian presence in South Sudan. And the, this long presence of humanitarian uh, agencies uh, is that it has become a source of um, self-doubt among South Sudanese themselves about their ability to tackle their own issues, about the ability of the state to respond without international assistance. It has increasingly led to this sense of self-doubt about our own ability as a people. Mm. And uh, uh, it is, uh, of course, the onus is on our state to try to, to, to speak about some of the achievements that have been made and admit some of the deficits uh, with an eye to a kind of uh, homegrown philosophy of resolution of these issues rather than constantly hoping the world will come for your rescue, that there would be a, a, a local uh, philosophy of how you end conflict, how you respond to humanitarian crisis, how you provide services, even if you, it is a, a mere question of saying that here are the priorities of the people, and here on this side are the resources we have, and here in the middle is the deficit uh, that we cannot do without the international support. At least there would be a clear roadmap so that uh, the international interventions in South Sudan would be uh, filling in the gap rather than coming with their own agenda. Uh, this is uh, what uh, perpetuates this face of humanitarian crisis being the face of the entire country. I'll, I'll, I'll stop at that and um, and hope we can have a discussion going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jock. And I think you raised a very important issue, reminding us of the magnitude of needs that Sudan was confronted with at the end of the war. I often say that um, this would have tested, you know, the most seasoned of governments. Uh, but it's interesting what you say about, you know, the the feeling of self-doubt that being a an NGO nation, a UN nation, or can can create. So something we can come back to in uh, during the discussion. Um, I'd like to welcome Nick Helton now. Nick is the coordinator for the South Sudan NGO Forum Secretariat, and he's previously served in South Sudan as a country director for humanitarian NGO, as well as in South Darfur leading a multi-sectoral humanitarian operation. Um, Nick, thank you very much for joining us at a short notice. 